Varadzes, yes, hi Kim. Yes, I'm from Yerevan, but I'm from San Francisco, California. Yes, hi Renet, can love Chem Chosum. So, I'm Anglerin. Okay, so I work at a company that builds drones with cameras as robots for capturing data, building 3D models, understanding the world. And I want to talk about some of the, the parts of that. It's mostly videos and pictures, so hopefully it's entertaining. And please ask any questions you want. Just raise your hand and interrupt me, no problem. Okay. So I will let's talk a bit about what the company does. So our goal is to make things more productive, creative, and safe with autonomous flight. And there's a lot of different use cases, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so the company now is a, is a pretty big company. We're the biggest drone company in, the, in, in America, um, and we're used across a lot of different use cases. And we have tens of thousands of drones out there. Um, and I've been there for, for eight years since we were just working out of a little house. And so I got to see a big part of the kind of journey of building um, the robots from just put together components and prototypes to pretty large scale kind of uh, building. So the, um, the the use cases for these kind of robots and drones are just span a lot of different industries and, and segments. So if you think about all kinds of kind um, inspection tasks, so any sort of buildings, commercial buildings, bridges, dams, any sort of infrastructure in any country around the world needs inspection. Um, they need pictures to look for damage. They need to track changes over time, plan out construction. Um, and we kind of focus on all, all of this different stuff. And the company started out just capturing video for, for filmmaking, for action sports. So if you're riding a bicycle, it can film you and get uh, cool footage. Um, and now uh, just a, re a really widespread set of, of use cases. But the common theme is basically the drone has cameras. The cameras need to see and understand the world, understand how to move, um, understand what's around, and be able to make decisions on, on its own and capture the right uh, photos and, and video. So the, the main focus of our, our company is getting the drone to fly itself by using the cameras to build a map of, of the world. And so the reason for that is because it's, it's hard to fly the drones. So if you're a trained pilot you, and you're an expert, you can fly it around um, and you can kind of capture the, the data. But for everybody else, it's, it's really hard. So making it easier by having the robot understand what it's doing and using AI and navigation to, uh, to basically do it itself makes it a lot more accessible to any any companies. Um, think like the you know the power company that manages electricity in Armenia uh, could use these things to scan their transmission towers and uh, find damage before something breaks. Um, and so a big part of the the company's focus is kind of going from one person flying a drone um, that's always controlling it to the drone basically doing a whole thing by itself for 20, 30 minutes and the person's just watching. Um, and then going from that to the point where there's no person there at all and from the point of the drone starting to fly to the point where the drone comes back home and does its whole mission, uh, nobody is there and it can be at some remote site and uh, you just program it and you get the photos on, you know, in, on the website and you can then do something with, with those photos. Um, and then and even more from there we kind of have this vision of having many drones do tasks together and have one drone located in one spot be able to do different missions for different use cases, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit. Um, so that's kind of the point of the, the company that we work on and, and the vision. Um, and I'm going to go into talking about kind of some of the technical parts of the, of the robot's navigation. And here is my dad with one of the drones. <laughs> Recently made it through Armenian customs. <laughs> this is a great timing. Okay, so, so I'm going to talk about three parts. The first is the core kind of visual navigation of the drone, um, how it uses its cameras to, to navigate the world. I'm going to talk about 3D scanning and building of 3D models from the image data. And then I'm going to talk about the, the dock and how it does missions from takeoff to landing and everything without ever um, needing a human to be there. Uh, so. So the drone itself, so this is our kind of second generation um, flagship drone, and it has, it has seven cameras. So I've kind of drawn arrows here for where the cameras are. There's basically three on the top here that are, um, provide navigation capability, and three on the bottom. 
So each of these six cameras is used to see in every direction at the same time. And the field of view is very large. It's something like 200 degrees of freedom. So it can see all the way here and all the way here with all three of these cameras. And so with them put together, it's kind of carefully designed to see in every direction so that we can fly anyway and have obstacle avoidance and, and not crash. And then this is the main camera. So this is the high resolution camera that's used for uh, capturing the, the images that primarily get used by whoever's flying it. Um, and so this camera is on a three axis gimbal here, so you can kind of see it stabilize. Um, so maybe I'll just pass this around if anyone wants to take a look. Okay, so, so the, as I kind of mentioned, the cameras are everything because everything we do is based on the cameras and the image data that's coming in from the cameras. And it's kind of been carefully designed here to have really wide uh, visibility. And, and a kind of fun thing is that the birds also work a lot like this where um, the different types of birds have very different goals. But for example, this bird is kind of crazy. You can actually see in front of it and behind it with these two eyes. And for most of the area, it only sees with one eye. But for the part that's directly forward, where it needs really good depth perception, um, it has two eyes so that it can compare the signals and do stereo vision. Um, and then our drone is uh, designed with those kind of things in mind to have multiple cameras see in, in um, the, the right directions that give the right signal. Um, so the hardest thing about this kind of navigation is that cameras are uh, they, you have a lot of different visual things that you can see. The drone can be flying anywhere, right? It could be flying in a jungle, it could be flying in a desert, it could be flying in this room. Um, and, it, and there's a lot of different types of uh, difficult things that are making it hard to figure out what is the 3D shape of the scene and, and pull out the data. So stuff like, um, stuff like water and moving waves, um, things like you know, glass and reflections and very thin wires that become hard to see, especially in difficult lighting, like a sun behind it. Um, things like these kind of camera effects where, you know, this will be, it's not a real shape that you're kind of building a 3D map of. It's, a, it's an artifact of the camera. Um, and so, yeah, white walls where there's really no texture, but you, you know, you have to know it's a white wall to not crash into it. Um, and, and, you know, you can get stuff like water and dirt and dust on the lenses. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff that makes it hard and that's kind of the core challenge of the, the visual navigation pieces. Um, so I won't talk about this too much, but uh, we have, you know, kind of like a technology architecture that is a lot like a self-driving car, um, where the, the core navigation here at the bottom, the goal is really don't crash and be able to move around wherever you are without the GPS signal. Um, if you're high up in the air, you can use GPS and it works well. But if you're under a bridge or inside a building, you can't do that. And so you have to use the cameras to move around. Um, and then up here is more like higher level applications. So the 3D scanning application, which I'll talk about later, is, is built at kind of this level and uses the core algorithms. And then there's this kind of middle set, which is really the new stuff, which is remembering a place the drone has flown between flights. So you, you have a, a bridge where the drone is installed and it does, it builds a map of the bridge. Then the next flight, it already knows where the bridge is and it can localize itself and um, already, you know, save time and get the exact same imagery, which I'll, I'll show a bunch of stuff about. Um, and then there's multiple ways of kind of controlling the drone, whether you're flying it yourself or you're doing it through a web browser, which I'll demo, or um, it's just doing it totally by itself. Um, so the, the core navigation pieces, so as I mentioned, kind of the you know, primary goal, basically navigate and, and don't crash. So these are the types of places where it's, it's really hard. You can't use GPS and you have to be very robust with the cameras. So if you're flying inside a bunch of these, these poles or up in a, this is in a bridge, in a metal structure, so there's no um, there's, no, there's no GPS and you kind of have shiny metal very close to you. Um, so it's the type of place where the, this sort of drone is the best option to get there and, and get the right data. Um, so the, the first step in this process is to use, um, to do state estimation, which is kind of like um, visual odometry, if, you, if you've heard that. So basically using the cameras and then the um, inertial measurement unit, so that's like the accelerometer and the gyroscope like in the phone, um, combining that together to 
understand the motion of the drone. And so the way it does this is, so if it's, if it's moving through this room, then the camera will um, you know, find interesting feature points, like uh, maybe this corner up here is something that three different cameras see when it's here. The drone comes over here, it sees these same points, and then it knows that if this point hasn't moved, and it sees it in these pixel coordinates here, and then a different pixel coordinate here, and that gives the information to solve for where is this point relative to the drone. And then that gets repeated with a lot of different points around the drone, and you get basically a, a trajectory of how the drone, drone moves, and this is the core thing. Um, in addition to that, there's a bunch of other things that get estimated. So for example, the, the properties of the camera lenses uh, can change with temperature, they can change when the drone hits things, um, which it you know, almost never does. But uh, the, so if you put it in you know, cold temperature to hot temperature, the lens will actually kind of shrink and expand. And so we need to actually estimate those things at the same time as we're estimating the, the rest of this. Okay, so uh, not crashing is kind of the, the thing that we are, have put the most focus in and, and are known for. So, the obstacle avoidance is, is the key where you're flying and you can try to push it into a tree, a wall, whatever, and it, it won't go. It will, it will stop itself. And the way we do this is using uh, deep learning for basically comparing the different images between the cameras and finding matches between them for every pixel and then turning that into a 3D map around the drone. So we can say, um, this, is a, this is a 360 view of all the drone's cameras combined. Um, so is, here it's flying down following a mountain biker, and this yellow box is actually the, the main camera. So this is what the output video would look like, but it's a very small part of the full 360. Um, and so here actually we're flying backwards for a lot of it in front of the mountain biker because it's a more exciting kind of video. But you have to imagine the drone's flying backwards at high speed, and then it has to duck trees that are behind it and plan out the shot. So. Um, that, uh, so we build a kind of a depth map like this, and these are examples of the images that, again, it's kind of, these are looking straight up because the camera is very wide field of view. Um, and so you can see kind of in all the directions, and these are the depth maps that are computed um, using our, our deep learning networks that are trained on a lot of um, simulation data and also a lot of real data. Uh, the problem with the real data is it's very hard to get the labels, like a, we have, billions of images of just flying around, but we don't know what the true depths of things are, and people can go sort of try to match a few of them, but it's, it's very, very hard to get real data for this. Um, so we put years and years of work in, into this and making it you know, work well. Um, could not load YouTube player, okay. Well. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, don't you use LiDAR for it? We don't, and it's a good question. Um, the reason we don't use LiDAR uh, is because on a drone that's this small, it really doesn't yet uh, offer a good balance of weight and size and cost. So um, some LiDARs are getting really small, like for example, the new iPhone Max has a LiDAR that works very well, um, but it works very well to a few meters. Um, and so if you're in a bright sunlight and you're flying and you want to see things that are 20 meters away, you need a way bigger LiDAR sensor that uses a lot of power and is very heavy. If it's very heavy, then the motors need to use a lot more power. Um, and so on, on this kind of size of a drone especially, if it was you know, a 20 kilogram drone, then much more so. But the, the cameras have all the information. It's kind of just harder to, to get for sure. Okay, um, and then yeah, and then, so from this kind of map of the, the environment and our estimation of how we're moving, we have to plan out where to, where to fly and the drone needs to navigate. And so we have a, a big complex kind of optimization problem that has a lot of different objectives that it's trying to solve. So there's the high level goal of what is the person trying to do. So for example, if we're filming somebody, uh, we might say we want to be in front of the person. So moving kind of the opposite way of their direction. Then we want to get smooth video, so don't really shake around a lot. And we might want to, um, well, we definitely want to not crash into things, so we have to avoid obstacles. And then we have to plan out what is aerodynamically feasible. Maybe there's you know, high wind in a certain direction. We have to consider that. Um, and, and so all these things need to get balanced. And 
we run a very fast kind of optimization problem on the drone that's constantly kind of deciding how to, how to fly and how to navigate. Um, and that's at the kind of high level planning and then goes all the way down to controlling the motors themselves at something like, this, this high level planning happens at maybe uh, 500 kind of optimization steps per second, but then at the, at the motors themselves is more like 30,000 times a second where you're controlling the voltage and the current and kind of trying to combine that all together. And at that low level, you're really mostly focusing on the kind of aerodynamics of the propeller itself and, and the control there. Um, hmm. It's gonna be a lot better if we can watch videos. Let's see. Oh, you know what? I'm just not connected to the internet. Is there a password for the game? You a guess lowercase? No. Mm. Three, five, seven. <laughs> okay, let's see if that works. Great. Perfect. Um, so put all together, this is just some fun video clips of things that our, our you know, video our customers have, have flown and put together with the drone, all of this navigation working together. So in all these cases, the person has set some kind of parameters for Maybe how far you want to be, what angle, how smooth you want the video, and different high-level high level things. So this was kind of the first, uh, even five years of the company. It was the primary use case. Yeah? You will only use a camera to scan an RA, right? To scan what? RA. Yes. Yes. OK. Um, then what kind of computer or controller you are using to solve this complex? Yeah, so this, this drone has um, two computers. The main computer for the algorithms is an NVIDIA uh, TX2. Um, and that's, uh, we, NVIDIA is uh, an investor of the company and we worked with them to design our own kind of custom board that has the, their computer integrated um, to save on weight and, and cost. Um, and that's the main processing. It has, uh, it has a decently beefy GPU. Um, and then there's also a Qualcomm chip that's primarily for processing the high resolution video from this um, because the Qualcomm is really uh, much better at that, that piece of it. Um, okay, uh, I think long term the focus, you, know, you can think about it kind of like being uh, like cell phones. We want the latest and greatest of what's in cell phones as they get smaller and lighter and faster and everyone works on accelerating AI stuff like we want the internals of that in a drone that gets um, increasingly you know smaller and more capable but at the same time you really want uh, very large camera sensors and that pushes the weight and size of the drone up because people will want much bigger cam like professional cameras thermal cameras different industrial use case sensors so those are kind of the main trade-offs of like the heaviest thing you need to carry is the camera and the entire drone is kind of built around that. And the bigger you make the propellers, also the, the quieter it is and the longer it can fly. Um, but that of course is less uh, accessible to, to use. And the bigger it is also a lot of things get more expensive. So there's some, there's some trade-offs there. All right, um, so I'm gonna talk about the 3D reconstruction pieces a, a little bit. So. This is going beyond just kind of local obstacle avoidance, but more about let's build a 3D model from what the drone captures and let's capture the data to build a 3D model. Um, so this is something that's a, a really big use case and, and, and used kind of everywhere around the world for all kinds of infrastructure. So this is an example of a piece of a bridge in Germany. Um, so this bridge, you know, uh, 
is, is fairly large. This is one of the main pillars, but this is something like um, the, the whole bridge takes tens of thousands of photos to inspect at some distance. So let's say you want to look for cracks and rust and maybe bolts that are breaking. Um, to do that, you need some certain resolution of imagery. So let's say it's one pixel is a, a one millimeter. So you need to take an image from, say, two or three meters away with this drone. Um, so to do that for a big bridge, it's a lot of photos. And this is an example of the, the bridge and all the different viewpoints of the, the photos that are taken. So you can imagine you're a trained pilot that's out there. Maybe it's a hot day. And you have to take tens of thousands of photos and keep track of where you image and not go back to the same place, not miss any spots. Because if you miss any spots, you go home, you try to build a 3D model, it won't work, and then you have to go back, and it's, it's really expensive and, and difficult. So basically focused on trying to automate that process um, by having the drone build kind of its own 3D model, track where it's got an imagery, and kind of map it out to try to get the perfect data set to, to build a 3D model or do an inspection. Um, so this is a video that kind of shows some pieces of that. So kind of traditionally, uh, there's a lot of alternatives to inspection that involve kind of stopping traffic and hanging a truck, using a helicopter, having people go off the edges. Um, also, you can, you can crash. Um, and, and it's important. It's done everywhere. Like disasters happen when things aren't caught. Um, and so the, the point of this kind of 3D scan is to uh, let you basically, this is a good image. So you basically choose the some 3D volume by, by choosing where the edges of it are. And then the drone will fly around and build a real-time kind of low-resolution map of it. Um, and that's kind of this, this yellow area. And then as it captures the photos, it'll plan out. You tell it what resolution you want, and it tries to go capture the data. And as it captures the data, it shows you the model in sort of augmented reality. And then it colors it. So when it goes to purple from yellow, that means it's captured the right data. And you can kind of see it, see it happening as it as it goes. Um, so here the white dots are the trajectory it's kind of planned for, for this use case. So uh, at that level, like when you're flying 3D scan, basically you're not using the sticks, you're just watching it and you're setting some parameters and you're making sure it doesn't miss anything. So this is an example of setting the bounds of the volume. Um, and then, yeah, this is building the 3D map and you can kind of see now you can choose what resolution you want, and that changes the flight path, how long it's going to take, how many photos. And then it will go capture the photos. It says maybe it's going to take 20 minutes, or maybe it's going to take two hours, and you need to change the battery multiple times because it, it runs out. And then you get a data set like that where you can you know, view, view stuff, and you can build 3D models from it. Um, so I'll show an example of that. So this is an example output of actually something that I, I captured um, in San Francisco. And so you can get a very detailed 3D model where um, this can then be used for all kinds of stuff. So looking for damage, but also planning modifications, using it in uh, games and, and VR, or just, um, uh, or just getting it 3D printed for fun. Um, Yeah, so, so the first step of the, the algorithm there is the part where we build the real-time map. So as the drone flies around, um, here it's trying to get within, say, like five meters of all the different parts so that it can use its navigation cameras um, and stereo vision to build the 3D map. So you can see it kind of being constructed here as the, the white line the drone kind of flies around and tries to find all parts of the volume. Um, and this doesn't have to be super detailed. This is just detailed enough so that you can plan out the path to go capture the more detailed imagery. And for planning out the path, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, the most important things are usually speed, so how fast can you do it, and kind of predictability. So one thing we found when we tried to get really fancy with the, the flight path here in Dynamic, it was uh, really scary to everybody when they didn't know where the drone was going to go next. Um, and so making like kind of a, a, a nice regular pattern that doesn't miss any spots but is very predictable, and we can say, here's how long it will take. Um, is, is really important here. Uh, and then, so for building the final high resolution model, then you're running a, a photogrammetry algorithm. So usually this is like a much more expensive offline version of what the drone is doing while flying. You process stuff at higher resolution, you do much more global optimization where you're doing uh, 
kind of a structure from motion optimization to very, very accurately find all the poses of the images and then build a detailed 3D model. Um, yeah, so, so as an example kind of put together, this is another uh, castle that um, I scanned where on the left here is just showing the images the drone captured and you can kind of see it's, it's chosen to have a, a overlap between the photos. You want multiple photos that can see any points so you can do kind of 3D triangulation, but not too many photos because then you're wasting time and data. Um, and then on the right is a yeah, 3D model that's, that's built from it. Um, maybe one more cool one with this helicopter. So this kind of thing takes not a lot of time to do anymore. You know, this, this one was 43 minutes, the last one was 30 minutes. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about the docking station next, but any, any questions on the 3D scanning stuff? Yeah. How do you synchronize all six cameras? Ah, um, in hardware. So we have a microcontroller um, that triggers um, all of the cameras to start their exposure. Um, and uh, that is a tricky problem otherwise. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we decided, we started as a software company, but we realized that in order to have a really well-working autonomous robot, you need to kind of control everything. So we started making the hardware and the electronics and the drivers and everything. Um, also mentioned the cameras are rolling shutter. So they, they uh, expose row by row. And so if your drone's moving, you need to model and correct for that too. Um, and that's something we put a lot of work into. Also, one of the nastiest problems tends to be vibrations. So if your propellers are moving through air, they create vibrations. Those vibrations propagate through the body. And if the cameras are moving with rolling shutter while the image is being captured, you get these kind of waves. Um, and it can get really nasty, and even in the main camera. So imagine the vehicle's shaking, then the gimbal, which is supposed to stabilize, also starts shaking against it, and it can be very hard to attenuate those signals. Um, so there's a lot of low-level camera things that are, are very tricky. Yeah? Uh, in your journey, have you tried using less cameras? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so the, um, well, our first drone had 13 cameras, so we we went down to seven. Um, using using uh, fewer cameras is obviously compelling from a size, and cost, and, and weight, although they're pretty cheap and the weight is not much, which is one of the reasons that we haven't put more focus on it. Um, but basically, the configuration here is allowing to see in every direction with at least two cameras. If you go down to one camera, then you can no longer do instantaneous stereo vision. Um, and you can still have one camera and then either do kind of monocular depth estimation, which these networks are pretty good at, but they tend to be pretty good at the easy stuff. Um, specifically, if you're driving, um, it works well there because you always have a road and the scene is very regular. You kind of know the road is flat, the stuff around are trees, they're vertical. If the drone is somewhere totally random where you can't really rely on that stuff, like imagine you're in just like a, a forest where in every direction is a bunch of branches it's very hard to use monocular depth estimation there effectively. So the second option is to use images between times. So you have one camera, the drone flies, and then you kind of do the, the matching. The problem there is that um, you, you need very, very accurate estimates of the camera's location to do that piece. If it's fixed in time, you know this transform very accurately. If it's not, then you just solve for that. Um, and it's very, very precise that it needs to be. And then the other, the other problem is um, things that move. So if you have branches that move with the wind, suddenly that's going to cause you a ton of trouble. Um, and so those are some of the challenges, but ultimately I, I think it will move to using fewer cameras. Um, yeah. Question here? Oh, so I was wondering how much of the image processing, like once you have all the images already, and like you just need to convert those into a 3D model, like how much of that is stuff that you all have to develop versus stuff that's already Developed yeah, uh, so there's a ton of uh, photogrammetry software that will build 3D models for you for different use cases that people use. There's programs that are really good and used in construction versus um, surveying or accident scene reconstruction or, or any, anything. Um, and, and they generally work well, um, but we, 
I guess because computer vision is our main focus and because we work on doing it really fast and, and on the drone, we also have built our own offline version. One reason is so that we have full control over it and in our own cloud system, which I'll show, we also use the 3D models and so we wanted to control that and we thought we could do it faster um, in part because we have certain advantages of the, the, nav the navigation cameras. Um, there's almost no photogrammetry software that will accept those and use those effectively. And so we have a lot of prior data to make that process go faster and work more robustly. Um, so if we've solved already for the poses of everything with these cameras, and then we kind of start the optimization of the main camera, it's, it can be a lot faster and, and work better. Um, all right, time, good. So, okay, the docking station. So this is the future for us. Um, this is kind of the later stages of what I mentioned. So we're going from, you fly the drone, it doesn't crash, to you're monitoring the drone as it scans a 3D volume or does some other task to a person's not there at all. The drone is completely by itself doing things. Um, and so we have kind of two versions of this. The, the basic requirement for this is uh, a home base where the drone can charge its battery and can upload data. So this dock is basically just a box where the drone lands in the thing, it slides in, and then it uh, charges the battery and it has an internet connection. So this is something you would install at you know, some industrial facility like a, a factory or an airport or a construction site that's ongoing or an electrical facility. Um, and then this is a small, cute version that just uh, doesn't have the security, doesn't have the environmental protection, but it's just a, a very lightweight pedestal that the drone can land on. Um, and so with, on top of this is a whole bunch of new software that supports this kind of end-to-end -end use case. So one part of the software is this whole kind of cloud ecosystem where we have you know, basically a website where you can see all your drones. Where are they? You can control the drone. So I can take a drone off from somewhere. Um, from anywhere in the world and fly it around um, and you can stream live video. So let's say you have a search and rescue going, somebody might be controlling the drone and then you might have 10 people watching it in real time looking for stuff. Um, and then on top of that is kind of the mission planning. So then you want to create a mission that the drone can run on a schedule. So you want some imagery every hour or every day at your facility and you can create this mission in a few ways. One way is by flying the mission and then the drone will repeat it. So you teach it once and then it repeats it every time. Um, there's other ways that where you just, you generate it from a 3D model or in the cloud, um, which, I'll, which I'll show. Um, but first I'll, I'll try a live demo here, uh, which is always fun. Um, so this is, this is uh, San Francisco up here and we have a, a warehouse over here where we keep, uh, it's a test warehouse for drones. I'll show a cool visual of it. Um, but let's say, Let's say this drone if we want to fly. So I click on that and then I'll attempt to connect and, and teleoperate it. So this is now a live video coming from California in this test warehouse where it is uh, 4 a.m. In the, in the night. Um, so we'll start up some of the algorithms and take off the drone. Hopefully. What if it's raining? This is indoors. So this is, um, this is a test warehouse uh, where we just have all day, all night, the drones are flying test missions. Oh, make it shoka. <laughs> okay, so. Drone is now flying. There's fun keyboard shortcuts. You can also connect uh, like a video game controller and fly it around. So here I go in and I am uh, flying around the warehouse. So I can go look at some stuff. Here's some other drones that are um, sitting here in the, in the docks. Show you around. Um, we can go. This is the drone coming? They're, Lego, they're big Legos. We're trying to make this a cool warehouse by adding all kinds of interesting structures and stuff to, to scan. Um, so for example, to get through this slot, I um, can go into a more reduced obstacles mode where it's, the drone flies slower, but it's willing to get closer to things. 
and I can, you know, I can go around, I can go into rooms, I can plan out a mission. So let's say I wanted to, you know, uh, make a mission that goes and looks at this little thing over here. Um, a cool thing is I can also click to fly. So instead of using the shortcuts, I can just click on something and the drone will kind of go towards it. Um, and then I can even zoom in here and get a nice close up view of what, what I'm looking at. And so if I were making a mission now, I could go to the mission planner and kind of walk me through um, creating a name of a mission, setting up waypoints, saying take some photos here, take a panorama here, um, go through this door, and you're basically just recording it. So then you can save it, and then you can put it on a calendar and say fly this every day at uh, noon and upload the photos. Then you can compare all of those photos together. Um, and, and so for this use case, because nobody's there, it basically just has to work. Like if when things go wrong, um, let's say you um, run low on battery or the wireless signal cuts out or for some reason the CPU, you, you have a program that crashes um, and you just like it has to be super reliable because this could be um, in theory kind of anywhere. Um, and one of the cool things here is so when I hit return, like it's, it's built a map of this warehouse before. Um, oh, interesting, it's even going back. So it's, uh, it's now backtracking via the path I came so that it knows how to kind of get back. Um, and so it will by itself kind of know how to go home and, and land when the mission is, is done. That's kind of the main, it has to get back no matter what. Um, so now it will reduce the normal obstacle mode. We'll go take some shortcuts back to find it's, it's, it's one of these little tripods. It'll look down find that tag, and then go land in it. And this is a pretty small landing pad. You can see those pins are for charging the battery. So uh, we have special batteries for the docks that have pins on the bottom, basically. All right. Um, so once we're, once we're done with that, now, all done, mission succeeded, and we can go back to looking at the main page. So here I can look at, you know, here's, here's all various kind of photos and videos of the flights that have happened, and here's the missions that are created so I can browse and edit these missions and I can put them on a schedule and I can see the results of the same mission flying at different times and then there's all kinds of um, ways to access this data in, in APIs and basically pull uh, pull them to some other company's website so they can do their own processing or we build 3D models from it or we run kind of AI models for detection of damage or, or other stuff. Um, so the main point of all this is the people that buy the dock, like they don't want to think about drones, they don't want to think about flying a robot or anything like that. They don't even know anything about that usually, and it's all about what is the data you get at the end of it. And usually they don't even want image data, they want something else. Like they want a spreadsheet of some results that might be um, what does this gauge say in my facility, um, or how many boxes are on this shelf, or what barcodes, or um, you know, things, things of that sort. Um, and so. There's a lot of uh, you know, AI models, foundation models for basically doing a lot of understanding of images, what's in images, how to find objects by example, and we're building a lot of this into basically the intelligence of the drone. Um, not just after flight, but also in flight. So you can say, go around this site and find me an object that looks like this. And then the drone will look for that, it'll zoom in, it'll take close-up photos and basically um, design uh, or, or save time and, and efficiency for that purpose. Yeah? Uh, for doing all of these tasks online, are you using some kind of multitask models or are you doing them separately? So you solve a lot of detection tasks and then you can easily do the same certification? Yeah, good question. Um, the, there's a bit of a combination. Um, in, in for a lot of the navigation stuff, it's, it's kind of more mature and made to be very fast. And some of those share important components. But sometimes they also have very different requirements. Like they might use 
different ones of the cameras and they need to work at different frame rates or might need to be zoomed in on some area. Um, and so often, you know, it's harder to share because of that. I think with, um, with more of these semantic foundation models, there's more opportunity to kind of use the same backbone for a bunch of different tasks and primarily on the main camera. And so there, it is the kind of thing where you want to maybe, you know, you run that at a regular rate, but you get a lot of info out of it. But it can be tricky to train those two, like balancing the data, and so it's, it's a challenge. Yes? Uh, are there any constraints on air speed, altitude, field of view? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, I mean, the main constraints, there, so there's the physical constraints of basically the strength of the propellers and motors. Um, so this drone uh, goes up to something like 16 meters per second um, in airspeed, mostly. So if you're flying downwind, you can fly faster. Um, and, and, that, uh, and then our, we have an enterprise drone that's larger, you can fly uh, in, in higher wind. Um, but at some point, you're just really fighting where if you um, you need to accelerate against the wind. You get a gust of wind with turbulence, and the motors just don't have enough power anymore to fight it. Um, I, I'm sorry. I mean about uh, navigation part. So yeah. 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 So that's so. So there's the hardware part, and then yeah, and then the algorithm part um, is is really like, it's more of a continuous scale of how likely is something to fail. So if we uh, have power lines in front of us, they're thin power lines, and we're flying at 16 meters per second versus eight, uh, we have to, you know, at the 16 meters per second, you have to see it from further away, which is harder. Um, so most of the time it will work. It's just the question of, does it crash one in a thousand times or one in 10,000 times? And even that's hard to say because it really depends on if there's a nice blue sky against it, then it's easy. If it's like a bright sun behind it, then it's hard. Um, if it's dark, uh, it's harder. And so there's so many environmental conditions. Um, and so. We basically set the limit for this drone at, at 16 meters per second, and we don't have a, a different limit that's like environmentally dependent because it's kind of confusing. But for example, if you um, flying on GPS instead of the vision, like let's say you're over water, then we'll have a bigger obstacle bubble. Um, and if you're flying uh, with a smaller obstacle bubble because you want to get through doorways, we limit the speed. So you can, if you want to get through narrow gaps, then we say only three meters per second you can go. So, stuff like that. One more question, yeah. uh, What about the calibration process uh, with IMU uh, processing unit and uh, cameras? Uh, yeah. Is um, it uh, difficult or something very... It is difficult. Um, so, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a factory calibration where we calibrate all the cameras. But and things change with temperature and, and, and movement. So um, our, that state estimation system that I showed at, at the start, uh, basically at the same time we're estimating the trajectories of the cameras, we're estimating the IMU biases. And there's multiple IMUs. There's an IMU on the gimbal. There's one at the base of the gimbal. There's one in the vehicle. And so um, it can be hard to observe those under certain motion. Like if you're flying in a straight line, it's kind of unobservable, your, your gravity vector against the orientation of the drone. Um, and so for that, um, you kind of have to make sure that you manage the uncertainty and say, I don't know until the drone turns. Otherwise, you can have something where you fly one kilometer in a straight line, then you turn, suddenly your guess was totally wrong, and the drone just crashes. We've had that for sure. Um, and so it's a tricky problem. Yeah? Um, do you have a separate model for Estimating the wind airspeed with cameras only? Yeah, the wind estimation um, doesn't happen with the cameras. It's mostly from, well, it uses the pose of the drone that's solved from the cameras, but it's also using the kind of readings from the motors themselves. So it's, a, it's more of a parametric dynamic model. It's not a deep network for, for us right now, um, but we estimate the, the speed of the wind relative to the body of the drone. That makes sense? Yeah, what about airspeed? Airspeed as well? Uh, so I, mean, I mean airspeed. So if, we, if, we, if we're estimating our ground speed relative to with the cameras, and then we're estimating the basically the airspeed, then the wind is the difference between those. 
So what's really being estimated is the, the air speed. Okay. Um, yeah, so a couple of, a couple of interesting things about the doc. So the first one is the visual localization. So that state estimation system I mentioned before is really about local navigation. Um, so we don't remember when we go around a building and come back. But for the doc, we need a much more global version. So that's what we call the, the VPS, Visual Positioning System. So here, if we flew around the warehouse, we have saved a map of it. We saved it in our cloud. And when a drone needs to fly a mission in the warehouse, we download that, and the drone uses that to localize against. So here it's showing an example of like the drones flying through and, and kind of building this map. And it's similar to the 3D scan map, but we're not doing a 3D scan like a person might have flown this. And then the next time, we're basically matching against things from that previous map. And what that gets us is that when you schedule this you know, a mission, then you can always go back and get the same imagery. Because otherwise, if you have even 1% you know, of drift, it's not going to work. You won't get back through the door. You'll get stuck. Um, so this was a major thing we had to build for the dock and took multiple years. Um, so this is a fun example of a mission that's running every 30 minutes for uh, 24 hours. And so it's able to <coughs> get back to the same point and, and capture the data very effectively. Uh, and then you can imagine, you know, there's boxes here and you scan the barcodes on them and you have an idea of your inventory every, every half an hour. Yeah? There's increasing regulations around drone usage. Can you supply constraints? Like, you know, if you live in an area or you have work in an area that says you can't fly above the next number of meters or there's an area that you're not allowed to fly to introduce those yourself to the drone? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so there's yeah, tons of stuff like that that we're having to build now to kind of scale this dock usage. So if you're indoors, you're generally okay. If you're outdoors, all of the regulation comes in. It varies a lot by country and use case, and there's different types of waivers you can get. Um, usually it's easier to fly lower near infrastructure where other airplanes won't be. Uh, it's easier if you're not near airports or other critical facilities. But um, depending on the use case, you get some, you know, there's some kind of laws, and then we have a bunch of features like you can see a map of your site in kind of 3D on top of a satellite map, and then you can define a volume saying this is the perimeter of my area, and then we try to enforce what we call a geofence there, where no matter what you're doing, the drone won't exit that area, and that's an important part of it, and you might put a ceiling on that as well. Um, within that area, you might also have a no-fly zone. So let's say you have a, a roadway where cars are driving, or you have some really important, I don't know, high-voltage like equipment, um, or somewhere where a crane operates and you define that volume in the cloud and say, you can fly within our site, but you don't fly within this kind of area. And then that's kind of being integrated into mission planning and other stuff. Quick follow-up question. How do you deal with the constraint hierarchy if the drone senses that in order to avoid an obstacle it needs to violate some constraint? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I think at some level kind of it comes down to the uh, an opinion. Like technically, it, it comes down to our motion planner and which of these things has kind of a stronger cost. So if you need to uh, evade the geofence to avoid an obstacle um, because it's kind of coming at you and you have another choice, then you might want to do that temporarily. Um, but if it's a static obstacle and there's a geofence here, then the drone will just stop and then decide to go around. So um, I don't know. I think mean, there's different... Everyone's got a different thing that they want the drone to do, so it's hard to make it configurable, but not too confusing. Because the more configurable it is, the more people make mistakes, they don't know what's happening, and then they get scared. It's an alert. Um, a good example might be like if you're doing a bridge inspection, often they have clearance to fly below the road, but they don't have any permission to fly above the plane of the road, because if any cars come by and they look at it, that's considered a distraction. So anytime the drone kind of breaks that plane and goes above, is big trouble. But in many other use cases, when you want to safely get back home, you have the drone fly high up in the air and then over, so it's not hitting any obstacles. And so those two things are just completely kind of opposed to each other, and it depends on the, the use case. Okay, um, just want to show, um, this is an example of like, we've built a 3D map of a warehouse, now you can tweak and define this mission in 3D in our cloud. And so instead of having to fly the drone, you can kind of procedurally generate a mission by saying, I want to scan aisles one, two, three. Or you can go and edit, edit the mission um, by dragging it around. Um, 
So the global planning piece is also really interesting. So the localization is where we build a map and remember it so we can know where we are. The global planning is about being able to get from any point to any other point within this site. So let's say that you um, want to say, I want to go to this room, and the drone is you know, uh, outside. And of course, that assumes the doors are open. But how would the drone know is because we built a topological map. Um, and so that, uh, that's kind of a key part of this. And then <coughs> let's say somebody blocking your way. The drone has to know the next best way around to, to get there. Um, and this is a fun example of just kind of repeatedly flying through a narrow hallway and a doorway, which requires really accurate localization, and it requires the, the global planning piece. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so there's a, I'll skip that one. So wind is also really interesting for landing in the, in the very small target that, that we have for this dock. So we built this kind of wind wall with propellers so we can simulate high turbulent winds. And you can kind of see a lot of testing we do from different directions and how the drone kind of controls that. And it's a, it's a tough, low-level kind of control problem to, to manage that and, and land. Um, cool. And then, yeah, this warehouse that we flew in, this has been amazing for us. So being able to basically to test these things, we want to get to the point where, you know, a company can have a thousand of these at their different locations and you install them and it's as easy as buying a washing machine. Where you're not thinking about the robot as much. Uh, it's going to take many years to get to that level of reliability, but that's the goal. And to do that, we have this warehouse where we fly all the time and we try to get a lot of, a lot of data and then have a lot of data analytics of understanding what's going wrong, what's the biggest blocker, how do we fix that. Um, but then beyond this warehouse, we also need to test that many different environmental cases outdoors, right? Test in a place where it's dusty, test in a place that's very cold, test in a place that's high altitude and the air is thin, so the propellers have to work harder. Um, and so that's kind of the, the process of making these things more and more autonomous, making them easier to use, just work all the time. And that's kind of what we're in the middle of at this point in our, in our company. Um, yeah, uh, so we published a bunch of interesting work and have a lot of people doing you know, good, good research in this area. Um, and uh, that's, that's it, so take any other questions? Yeah. You have a, uh, like a scenario where you fly two drones simultaneously, or multiple drones simultaneously, and you get one mission? Yeah, um, we don't have that in like a production. You can't do that today, but we've done a lot of demos of it, and it's an obvious fun, fun thing. So the easy version of that is something like a, a 2D area scan where you'd take a big mission, you'd split it in half, you'd say, let's have two drones do it, or four drones do each a quarter. Um, there's more uh, kind of advanced version where you, they're actually communicating about their 3D location to each other and avoiding each other and learning stuff. Um, we've done some demos of that. Um, and then there's the more basic use case where you have, say, one controller, and there's four drones, and you say, go to this GPS point, go to four different angles and give me video from four directions at once. So you might want that for, say, like a police scenario. And that is something that we, we do have and customers use. Um, yeah. Also, have you run your own simulations software for this? Um, we do, we do have a, diff, a bunch of parts of simulation. So the, the robot part with the dynamics and the motion, we, we wrote our own. Um, for the kind of data generation for deep learning, we have a bunch of tools built on Unreal Engine um, where we get realistic data from realistic scenarios. And then we have a bunch of layers to create kind of our navigation cameras where we... Yeah. yeah. And the uh, control part? The control part isn't, we don't do that part in Unreal Engine. We just have our own code to simulate those sensors. So our simulation that has the photorealistic part really is for generating offline data. And then we have a different simulator that generates, is more of like a real-time simulator that generates images. That's based on a different kind of race tracing engine that's not Unreal Engine, generally because it's, it's faster, but lower quality. Um, and so there you can fly around 
in kind of real time, and there we have our code that manages the sensors. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, um, so the, the difference between our drone and DJI drone, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's very similar. Um, I think the main focus of us is building this sort of like end-to-end -end autonomous missions and, and activity and building the kind of product and user use cases around that. Um, so in the space of uh, when we're talking about kind of the consumer filming type stuff, so at the time that we you know, built that, DJI was really just flown manually. Now they have a lot of those same features where they kind of follow and film. I still think our, our obstacle avoidance and, and sort of autonomous navigation at the core is better. But the thing that um, we are now trying to build that's really our main focus is the, these sort of like end-to-end -end missions with complex navigation and, and um, in different visually difficult scenarios. Um, and so uh, that's, that's where we are. But um, for sure, DJI is kind of the the biggest competitor and the, the biggest company in the space. Yeah, so this, this drone has been in production for a couple of years. So we've sold tens of thousands of them. Um, the, the drone for, um, the basic drone for people buying is around um, Eleven hundred dollars, but mostly we sell these. Uh, we call more pro kits with a bunch of different things installed, and there's something like two thousand, two thousand five hundred dollars. Um, and then there's uh, for the increasingly the focus is on these commercial use cases, and there it's really about the software that's on top, and that's more of like what software is using for autonomous bridge inspection and with these docks. So it's a very different model there, where the drone itself is very cheap compared to the whole thing. And if the drone crashes, you kind of just get a new one, um, and it's a different business model. Yeah. And then with the improving algorithms, you do the semantic segmentation, yes? Yes. And uh, do you use uh, object detection? Do you need to like uh, have the algorithm for the object detection or something that motion uh, to understand the motion of other objects? Like there are some other drones that by this way, so the drone understands that it would go, it would continue to go this way, so it will not go that way. So do you do yeah. that part? Yeah, um, we, we do some of it. I would say we're not very good at it right now. Mostly the, we haven't focused on that because it's challenging on this generation of drones computationally. Um, when we are tracking a person or a car, we track their motion, we predict their motion, and we uh, so if the drone is following you and you try to run at it, it will very quickly move out of the way to avoid you. If the drone is just sitting there and you run up to it and, and grab it, you can do that, and then we won't, we won't be able to avoid that. That's something we are hoping to change with our next generation of drone that has much more computing power. Um, yeah. And if you fly at it with another drone, also, I, I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna to avoid that, unless it's very slow. Also, one question, why, why, why don't we use the FPGAs for the drones because of the cost or yeah, like, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, why don't I use FPGAs for the drones? So I think um, there's, 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 a cost, there's a cost and a size and a weight. Yeah, FPGAs tend to be bigger. I mean, if you go to like an ASIC that's built in, then at scale, like you you can get a lot of wins, but the, 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 the reality is like so far our software has been changing so frequently that it's difficult to get it down to say we want this important part to be on an ASIC. Um, and at the same time, the, the chips that have the NVIDIA, Qualcomm chips and other accelerators are getting much faster to the point where they have multiple accelerators on board there. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to say we're going to have a multi-year project where we pay millions of dollars to develop you know, a hardened ASIC for something that maybe the next generation of, of chip where uh, Qualcomm has invested hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars to do that can have more capability. So I think we're basically not at the scale yet and maturity yet where that is worth it. Yeah. Do you use GPS or no? Yeah, so we, we do use GPS. Um, if you fly indoor? If we fly indoor, no. Uh, we basically use GPS when we need it. 
Um, and so uh, usually that's very far away from things, high up in the air or like over water um, where there's nothing else to visually uh, use. Um, and so if you're flying indoors here, there might be an okay GPS signal. It won't be very good. Um, and we'll be kind of tracking it, but we're not using it. Yeah. We don't use the DeepStream library. Um, we, uh, we basically have our own kind of camera processing driver pipeline, and then we, we do use their TensorRT deep learning accelerator, but we kind of have our own stack built around that. Again, for more control and um, feeding into kind of geometric processing that might be after the deep network. Uh, basically, more or less any time there's something that's uh, closed source, especially from NVIDIA, we don't want to use it if we can uh, avoid it. Yeah? To be honest, this is one of the amazing things I have seen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how can I find out more details about to this kind of machinery model? Do you have any papers? Um, so we have, uh, yeah, so. To find out more about the product, you, there's tons of stuff on the internet. To find out more about the, the, the algorithms and stuff, I can recommend. Um, this, was, this was for our core obstacle avoidance. This was one paper that we published um, that kind of describes some of the, the root of what became our deep learning obstacle avoidance. Um, and then this library here, uh, this is something we published last year. And this is an open source library that does symbolic computation um, and, and code generation. Uh, so, so this is something we use for both our vision algorithms and for our motion planning optimization. Um, so that's the biggest piece of it that's kind of open source and accessible and it's, it's uh, pretty fun and easy to use for um, even in kind of uh, university classes, but then is easily transferable to kind of a production robot. Um, those are probably the best references I can, I can do right now. Yeah. All right. Is it? Yeah, we're past time. Okay, so thanks all. That's that's it.